Master Mirror introduced six brand new evolving cards displaying the life or part of the life of six characters from the Witcher universe. Some are familiar characters to anyone who's played the games, such as the Dryad Queen Etne or the Grand Master of the Order of the Flaming Rose, Jacques de Aldersberg. Others are more obscure, but their stories are just as interesting. In today's video, we will be taking a look at the fascinating life story of the prince and eventual king of Karak, Varaxis. All of the information in this video originates from the Season of Storms book by Witcher author Sapkowski, a prequel story based on Geralt's time in Karak and the surrounding lands, so if you're interested in reading that story in full, let this be your one and only spoiler warning. Read it and then come back here. I'll still be right where I am. All good? Great, let's dive in. To understand Varaxis' history, we first need to talk about the kingdom he eventually takes control of, Karak. Karak is a relatively young kingdom, founded by the self-appointed first king, Osmic. Osmic lived in the seaside region and accumulated a considerable amount of wealth by lieu of maritime trading allowing him to seize control over the adjacent lands. Over the next decades, the wealth of Karak only increased when the maritime trading business was expanded to boat building, smuggling and a bit of buccaneering. When King Osmic died, his son Balahan ascended the throne, as is custom. Osmic had at least four sons, but all of Balahan's brothers rescinded their claim on the throne for unknown reasons. We can only guess what those reasons were, but it's safe to say that Balahan had some leverage over his brothers one way or another. Balahan continued to rule over the kingdom of Karak and its profitable businesses, reigning for 20 years and, following in his father's footsteps, conceived of four legitimate sons, each with a different mother and numerous daughters and bastards to go along with it. Balahan's wives didn't have a particularly long lifespan. All of them died under suspicious circumstances, after which the good king quickly remarried to a new, young and beautiful wife. His four sons were named Varaxis, Elmer, Egmund and Xander. But no one was allowed to speak the name of his oldest son anymore. So Balahan's oldest son was Varaxis. A tall, strong and lively young lad, better than his father in every way. While other parents would be proud to have a son like Varaxis, Balahan was no such man. As Varaxis grew older, Balahan started becoming more and more envious and wary of his son's ambition. Fearing a coup similar to what he did with his father and brothers, Balahan got into an argument with his eldest son and eventually banished him from Karak seemingly just out of spite, since the people of Karak were even prohibited by royal decree to never utter his name ever again. The succession of the throne was never threatened, however. Balahan swapped wives like a fisherman swaps trousers and fathered three more sons, a few daughters and countless bastard children. Elmer, his second son, was the complete opposite of his elder brother and quickly turned into a drunken failure of a man who was never going to become king. His next two sons, Egmund and Xander, showed more promise. Both were also very ambitious and to keep them in check, Balahan constantly changed his mind on who would succeed him as king of Karak. This insecurity frustrated the two brothers to no end as they tried to vie for their father's approval only to be disappointed time after time. Balahan treated his wives as he did his sons, luring them in with the promise of wealth and power, only to be discarded once he was done with them. Which brings us to the wedding where everything changed. His latest wife was called Ildiko Breckel, a beautiful, young, blonde woman, seemingly another victim in a line of discarded queens, but there was definitely more to her than meets the eye. More on her in a minute. As Balahun once again feared the ambition of his youngest sons, he teased them with the fact that his newest wife would bear the next king of Karak, his fifth son. But against all odds, this didn't ignite any rebellion in Egmund and Xander. They still fostered hope to one day become the king of Karak, but they loved their father nonetheless. 
In preparation of the festivities, Prince Xander even reached out to a certain white-haired witcher to secretly protect his father during the wedding, blackmailing the witcher to force him to keep his word. Balahan had plans of his own though. On the suggestion of his new wife, the king commissioned a mercenary ship, the Acherontia, for a very special job. See, Balahan got word of the hiring of Geralt, the witcher, and immediately assumed that his sons hired him as an assassin instead of an armed guard. Right before the wedding, he confronted his sons and the witcher with this, and without any possibility of defense, had all of them arrested. They would be escorted out of Karak on the Acherontia, while the mercenaries would also serve as extra protection during the wedding. A move that would turn out very badly for the king himself. See, the soon-to-be queen had a little secret and a big plan of her own. Ildiko wasn't just any woman. She had some magical abilities, but she was kicked out of Aretuza in her third year for petty theft, preventing her from becoming a full sorceress. That didn't stop her ambition, however, since she just orchestrated the coup of the century. Her wedding gift to the king was a golden necklace with a medallion adorned with a dolphin, the crest of Karak. As the king was preparing for his wedding at the tailor, he put on the medallion as a sign of love for his new bride, only to stumble down to the floor moments later, gasping for air. The necklace had contracted, cutting deep into his flesh, strangling the king who didn't stand a chance against the magical artifact. While the king lay dying, the mercenaries of the Acherontia disembarked with a handsome man at the front marching to the upper city and the palace itself. He barged into the throne room and set himself down on his rightful seat, his crew proclaiming to everyone that the new king had arrived, Varaxis, first of his name. Varaxis would not only take his father's throne but also his wife, something Ildiko clearly didn't object to. In accordance to his father's final wishes, he would also banish his two brothers, Egmund and Xander, from the kingdom, eliminating his competition at the same time. The white-haired witcher, however, had killed his guards and escaped, but Varaxis was sure that the witcher would not be seen in Karak again. Since Belohan never officially appointed an heir, nobody could dispute Varaxis' claim. He was Belohan's eldest son, after all, which meant that the old king's indecisiveness and paranoia eventually caused his own demise. See, Varaxis and Ildiko were lovers long before the death of Balahan, and they conceived of a plan to take back control of Karak. While Varaxis vied for the support of the neighboring kingdoms, who were all too happy to gain back some leverage over the young and wealthy kingdom, Ildiko infiltrated Karak's court and seduced Balahan to become his next wife. She enchanted the murderous medallion that would eventually kill the king and manipulated him into bringing the Acherontia to Karak and with it Varaxis and a small private army. With the support of several kingdoms already in his pocket and the legitimate claim to the throne, Varaxis had everything he needed to overthrow his father in the ultimate revenge ploy. And the rest is history. After the coronation, Varaxis immediately set up a bunch of rules that were detrimental to the kingdom, some clearly inspired by his vengeful bride. He doubled port and custom fees in the hopes of quickly increasing his own wealth, but instead he basically scared away the biggest income Karak had in one fell swoop. He started a brutal crackdown on both non-humans and practitioners of magic. Ildiko's envy toward sorceresses clearly had a hand in the latter. None were allowed to stay in the city unless they were heavily regulated. Combined with a horrifically destructive storm that ravaged the port soon after the coronation and took the lives of many, the new regulations caused the city and the kingdom to spiral towards their inevitable doom. Varaxis's cunning was outmatched by his lack of leadership, and the kingdoms that once supported him during the coup were all too eager to divvy up the pieces when things went to hell. Varaxis managed to hold on to power for a bit, but eventually, Karak fell to ruin just as quickly as it was created, and became just a footnote in history. And that's the story of Varaxis and Karak. I hope you enjoyed this first episode 
of Gwent Storytime. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below, because I'm really curious about what you all think. Check me out on Twitter if you want to talk under at TrophyNut, that's T-R-O-V-N-U-T. And if you enjoyed this episode, why not give it a like? Any support is really appreciated. Thanks enormously for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next episode of Gwent Storytime. Goodbye!